Gym Committee meeting for May 22nd, 2023. Um, I apologize for the late start. I ran late, but Jenna says I'm allowed to be late once every eight years, so we're good. Um, with that, we will move uh, to our first order of business is approval of the agenda. If there's no changes or additions, we can proceed. So moved. Very Second. Good. Very good. Um, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those nay. And the motion carries. Next, we're on to approval of the May 8th, 2018. 2023 uh, Transportation Committee me meeting minutes. Did anyone have any changes or additions? All right, uh, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Aye. So moved. Uh, moved by Councilmember Morales, seconded by Councilmember Tyrone Carter. Is there any other discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, and the motion carries. So uh, now we're moving to employee recognition. So I will turn it over to um, uh, General Man Interim General Manager Leslie Kinderis. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Chair Barber, committee members, thank you. Uh, today we are bringing forward two groups of employees as part of our monthly employee recognition program. The first group of honorees comes from our material management department, which handles our vast inventory of supplies, which is about 18,000 or more unique items collectively uh, worth over million, millions of dollars. Uh, and the second group comes from our transit control center where staff work 24 seven taking calls from bus operators, managing unexpected delays and detours and dispatching police officers among their many other duties. Um, as our presenters will share, these individuals are being recognized here together for a reason. In each case, success came as a result of a collective effort. So before I hand things over, I just personally wanna add my thanks to all of them for demonstrating teamwork and coming together again today to be with us for this. So with that, uh, we'll first start with Chris Hafner from Material Management. Either side. All right. <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the uh, committee, uh, it's my honor to be here today to present uh, a few of the 50 plus team members of the Material Management Department of Metro Transit. As Ms. Kandara said, we are responsible for the inventory management and inventory control of all the parts and supplies that Metro Transit uses to maintain its revenue fleet, as well as the general supplies Metro Transit uses to stay operational. We currently stock about 17,000 different SKUs, and our standing inventory is currently exceeding $66 million. Like all logistical support jobs, when things are executed as planned, these employees go unnoticed. So I'm glad we get to celebrate just one of the many examples of the great work that happens every day at Metro Transit's Material Management Department. Um, Jason, Jonathan, and John, stand up guys. Um, as well as Mike Anderson, who isn't here today. He's at vacation up north at Cabin. We're responsible for the inventory planning and inventory control operations for the recent move from Reuter to the North Loop Garage. Uh, last summer, Jason Adams began the planning for the inventory of North Loop Garage, where it, was best to where it was the best use of taxpayers' money. He requisitioned float stock, where he felt float stock was an inappropriate. He vigilantly balanced and monitored the overall stock so that MJR did not run out of parts and North Loop had the correct parts when it was opening. Beginning in October, John Baker, Mike Anderson, and Jonathan Schwab began the executing the plan. It took over four months to place over 2,200 SKUs, 55,000 pieces, and $718 worth of parts into the North Loop Garage, as well as at the same time, remove the 3,500 SKUs and 75,000 pieces out of MJR Garage. Under Jason and Jonathan's leadership and John and Mike's attention to detail and execution, we we're able to draw down Reuter without negatively impacting operations and successfully open North Loop Garage on March 18th. So thank you very much for the recognition. I feel it's, it's very well deserved for these four individuals. Thank you. Thank you. And we've got a few more awards. And then the, after we do all of them, we'll come over and meet you and give you your plaques. Right. And Chair Barber, our second presenter will be Carrie Sampson to talk about the Transit Control Center's work. Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Carrie Sampson and I'm the manager at our Transit Control Center. All of our TCC supervisors are deserving of recognition. And in fact, I'm here, I was here not all that long ago to present another member of our team. Today I'm proud to introduce you to three of our six supervisors and I look forward to being back in the future. We'll get to everyone. 
Um, this is, well, David Barnhart, Mike Holston, and Keith Cartier. And I nominated this team for creating, revamping, and reformatting our large collection of SOPs, a vast and time-consuming project. The team went through each SOP with a fine-tooth comb, discussing relevancy issues, formatting, and how it fit into our department goals. The organization to create this process is worthy of its own award. Through digital and in-person collaboration, a process has been established and used to vet out each SOP. This process is truly amazing, and the dedication of the team goes over and above the hard work they already do to keep service on schedule, manage calls for police service, and juggle a variety of other tasks. We are incredibly fortunate to have this team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both groups. So it's work like that, like the uh, materials management and traffic control center that people don't see all the time. And But we know that we couldn't function as an organization without that. So thank you very much. And we'll have some more All right, come on. We'll try to be organized, but we're never organized. So with this. All right. Jesse, is there what you're saying? The right one. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. All right. I want to know every acronym. Thank you so much for I'm just looking at this one. Thank you so much. SOP. What is it? All right. What is it? That's what we're doing. Standard operating procedure. Standard operating procedure. Standard operating procedure. Of course it does. Of course. Of course. Man. Thank you, when I was working with first and third graders, we just called them the classroom rules. <laughs> Which just as we go. Thank you. All right. Um, is there a good? We're on to our next round of uh, business um, is our reports. And we have MTS uh, Services uh, Director Charles Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Council Members. Uh, I will start by noting that yesterday the state legislature approved a transportation bill that's been sent to the, for Governor Walz's consideration. Uh, the bill contains a number of funding provisions, policy measures, and other changes that, if signed into law, uh, could be transformative for the region. And I won't go into detail today, but I understand that Judd Shetnan will be providing an update at Wednesday's Metropolitan Council meeting on the, on the session as a whole. So uh, we'll defer uh, the details until another time uh, and, and Judd's update, but we do look forward to reviewing the bill in greater detail and uh, potentially implementing the work uh, should it be signed into law. On uh, another funding note, um, motor vehicle sales tax receipts updates are in for April, and April uh, numbers are 32.5 million for the council, which is a uh, over the forecast. It's 105 um, percent of the forecast, so five percent over. Uh, year to date, the council's received uh, just under 122 million, or right around 110 percent of the forecast, so 10 uh, percent above. Every month this year has, a, has performed above forecast, which is good, but you might also recall that last, that uh, in February they lowered the forecast. However, it has over overperformed. Uh, we budget, you'll hear more about this as we roll out the 2024 operating budget information items in a month or so ahead, uh, but uh, we budget at 95% of forecast uh, and the rest goes into a reserve account. Because of the volatility of motor vehicle sales, uh, it's a way we can stabilize our budget. So behind these receipts is the story of the U.S. auto market and auto sales were uh, in, in April were 1.357 million units. Uh, which is a increased, what's happening is increasing supply is driving increased sales. So there had been, uh, last April, uh, still lingering supply chain shortages. Those are uh, continuing to be resolved and boost, boost sales, in this case, about 8% above last April um, as a result. 
Uh, and the average new car price remains relatively flat, but over $48,000. Uh, so that is part of what's driving the transit funding we receive. On the planning side, uh, our planning staff held two workshops last, uh, or on May 11th and May 18th, seeking input on potential transportation goals and objectives for the region's transportation plan that we're beginning work on. Uh, these workshops engage a wide variety of regional stakeholders. Uh, we had dozens of participants. Uh, you know, these were these were not for council members, but for sort of other partners uh, to provide input to you as we bring as we bring the plan forward. Uh, really fantastic discussion and really helpful feedback uh, in in both of the meetings. Uh, we're planning an update at transportation committee in July, uh, tentatively July 10th to bring you more feedback about the workshops because they're really uh, fantastic sessions. So this afternoon, uh, you each received an email from Cole Hineker with a link to a survey that was conducted for those workshop participants, uh, but we'd also like you to complete the survey. So we encourage you to do so. Uh, please do so by Wednesday, uh, May 24th this Wednesday, and provide your name in, in the response so, we, uh, so we're sure to know uh, what your input was. With that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Charles. Um, questions or comments from council members? I'll just comment uh, briefly. I'm very excited to see what we're getting um, coming through the legislature with the transportation funding bill. Looking forward to learning the details. There will be a lot of financial analysis as we go forward to understand what it means and what it doesn't mean. But um, really, really um, to be in a position where we're not looking at one-time funding and looking at being able to look at the long-term big picture is something that is, is not something we've been able to say at this committee since I've been on council. Mm -hmm. And so it really is um, transformative or transformative, I think, in, in, in nature. So I'm um, very thankful. But yes, definitely looking forward to understanding all of it. Um, next, we'll go on to our next report, which is um, Metro Transit Interim General Manager, Leslie Kanderis. Chair Barber, committee members, uh, I'll also start by just recognizing the legislature's actions this weekend, uh, passing the bills of the House and Senate yesterday. And we also are uh, awaiting the governor's signature, but already starting to really look and discuss at what that bill means for us. And I am confident Metro Transit will be bringing many items to this committee, both in terms of updates and things we'll need action on too. So very, very exciting time. Um, for my report, I, I want to acknowledge a couple of events that happened this weekend. Um, First, sadly, early Saturday morning, a person died after being hit by a train at Warehouse Station in Minneapolis and wanted to mention and bring it up here just to acknowledge that any death on transit is tragic. And our thoughts go to that person's loved ones and also <coughs> to our own employees who witnessed or responded to that horrific event. Um, also on Saturday, a very different type of incident. Uh, we had an unplanned suspension of light rail service on Saturday afternoon. Uh, this was due to an IT issue. Uh, it was resolved within two hours and our information services department continues to investigate what caused the problem. Uh, but just wanted to recognize that we know that creates uh, tremendous inconvenience for our customers, especially with no notice like that. And, and we take that very seriously and uh, continue to work with IS as they learn uh, what what went wrong there. Uh, and finally, on a more positive note, um, as this committee gears up to go back to Haywood in July, uh, before that, uh, we're working to offer a tour of our Green Line Operations and Maintenance Facility in Lower Town. It'll likely happen before the June 26th meeting of this committee for people who are interested. Uh, last time, we brought a business item relating to the expansion project we plan to do there. That's going to be in front of council on Wednesday, too. But just seemed like a good opportunity before we go to the other side of the river to invite you into that facility and, and show it to you firsthand. So look for more information on that. Uh, and then with that, I take any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from council members? Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we are on to our tab report, and today we have Mr. DeGan, um, our tab liaison here to report. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, uh, the Honorable Council Members, uh, Director Carlson, of course, uh, Interim General Manager Kanderis, I see uh, Chief Operating Officer Funk is in the room, as well as Direct Deputy Director Thompson. Uh, I am Peter Dugan. I am the TAB liaison to this committee. Uh, we all know what TAB is, and we'll go through a little bit of that today, but I am the citizen member for uh, TAB District 
H, which is generally council districts 15 and 16. That would be council members Tolkar and Wolf. Uh, generally Dakota County. I'm also the water and coffee person if you need it during the meeting. That's <laughs> just great. Uh, just kind of, okay. uh, as, as you know, you get a detailed report on the tab, which looks like this. It comes through, and I'm going to add to that a little bit today and also uh, walk through just a couple of, of uh, m not minor points, but uh, points of discussion in, in regard to what a, you know, a tip, stream tip line, streamlined tip amendment is. A streamlined tip amendment is, is an amendment to the Transportation Improvement Plan and it has to meet, to be streamlined, which means it goes through to your consent agenda, and as well as a tab, it has to meet three criteria. It is, it is consistent with the TPP, the Transportation Policy Plan. It is not a significantly, not a significant regionally, not a significant regional project, and I'll define that later, and it doesn't require a formal scope change. Later on, we'll go through, you know, the, the ABCs of scope changes, but they are, uh, Administrative, informal, and formal. And formal scope change is just what it sounds, something a big deal. The, the real key is, is it regionally significant? And that is determined by the Code of, Fed, Code of Federal Regulation, CFR, I think it's 405, which the Transportation Policy Plan is based on. Regionally significant is a major transit hub, a, a sports complex, new retail mall, housing project, something that, and access to and from the metro. So those are considered regionally significant, and they could not have a streamlined <coughs> TIP amendment. Uh, also, uh, in, in supplemental information from the tab, to the tab, I'd like to go over, uh, with the chairs, okay, the uh, toward, toward zero death, TZT, and the statistics where we are in the metro in the state as of uh, May 9th. Uh, for the seven-county metro, we have, uh, we have, uh, we have, Total, we have vehicle and pedestrian fatalities, no bike or motorcycle. However, we have 36 total and 10 of those are pedestrians. Although that is downward trending, uh, uh, MnDOT notes that the June through October is the deadliest period for us. Statewide, so far in 2023 through May 9th is 92 fatalities. Last year, it was uh, 117 at this point. The 2022 preliminary fatality estimate is 444. Okay, and uh, okay. Uh, come, later on, and I won't do it all t today, but I'd like to revisit with you what is what is TAB. I know you you all know what it is, but there's aspects of it. The TAB, the, the technical committees, and they they too have standing committees and who's composed, who they are composed of. And I'll, in the interest of time, I'll revisit that perhaps at next month's meeting because I'd like to address in the first paragraph of, uh, of the summary report some additional <coughs> information. Chair Hovland, uh, James Hovland, Mayor Vadinan, Chair of TAB, uh, recently attended a U.S. Conference of, uh, of Mayors uh, conference. And there, there were two, if you will, futurists of sorts uh, speaking on working from home and the impact that has made and what it will make on public transportation and city cores. One of the speakers was Nicholas Bloom, a professor at Stanford, considered by, by, by Bloomberg as the, one of the top 50 economic experts in the country, particularly on working from home. The other, and I'll mention this only because he comes up in, in, in discussion, is a Richard Florida. He is a professor of, uh, and a theorist of urban studies and planning. Uh, he is he is the author of okay the creative the rise of the creative class creative class the flight of the creative class mm -hmm. and now who's your city mm -hmm. I, I bring that up only because he is fairly controversial he has a number of theories and although he I, I believe he was a speaker they I just wanted to mention his name and they are controversial considered by some. To add to uh, Chair Hovland's remarks that are contained in the summary report, uh, the, the percent of, of, of work from home folks uh, sta has stabilized at 30%, and that's as of 2021 so far. It's, but the, the work from home increase between 2020 and 2022 is over, <clears throat> excuse me, is, a, is what would have been 40 years previously. 
So in just two years, it would have been what 40 years would have taken in, in terms of normal working from home, changing. The largest working from home is in college and university cities and large cities. Uh, the people at site, people on site at office building is hovering around 60%. Hybrid coming in two to three days a week is 30%, and fully working from home is about 11%. I can tell you from downtown, the downtown Minneapolis Council, they uh, posited at 64% of people are working downtown. However, that is not five days a week. That is, you know, an asterisk. The, according to U US, United States Postal Service address change uh, forms, about a million people left large city centers uh, in, in 2020, um, 2022, and this data is through 2023. Um, the, uh, Mr. Bloom, Professor Bloom, says, it, it, uh, explains that large cities will continue to see a uh, reduction in density at the core, and there'll be conversion of office space to residential, um, which I think we're already seeing. There is a shifting in retail spending, leaving large cities and not coming back, and, uh, and Although they, and it's going to the suburbs and the exurbs, and that is housing and retail sales. And the city cited are all very large city, except for Boston, which is about 750,000. And their retail spending is down 2,500 per capita. That has been lo not lost, but it's transferred to another part of the state or the Commonwealth. Uh, public transit journeys have fallen by 30% from February 2020 to March 2023. Vehicle miles traveled are up, of course. And interestingly enough, uh, he does say in the remarks, you know, golf is up, and it's particularly Wednesday afternoons, up 178%. That's what <laughs> And in the longer run, technology, <laughs> I don't golf. <clears throat> I don't, <clears throat> I don't fish, hunt, or own a cabin, and they're going to they're going to revoke my visa anytime soon now. <laughs> <laughs> they, <clears throat> and longer longer running technology will contribute to an increase and then continue to increase in work from home, and that will be such things as scheduling software for not only time but space, and virtual reality. Uh, and of course, technology only accelerated what was happening before the pandemic. I can say in the case of my company, if we have a, uh, a, a work to kind of a hotel work to situation, kind of like uh, uh, we work, uh, if you're familiar with that, and we do schedule space ahead of time. Not only time, we'll meet you at 10, but we're going to schedule that space. Uh, so that's, again, just our, you know, we're just an ordinary company which is taking, uh, taking place. And if I may, just a couple of uh, what, what has increased working from, uh, from home done to uh, employers? Um, Part-time employees are at 23%. Independent contractors are 18 Domestic outsourcing is 16%. Offshoring, 7 And the employment of the physically challenged is now at 5%. And uh, the, the conclusions that he draws is the typically two days a week is what will be working from home for the average worker. Uh, the larger cities I mentioned, and longer term, uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, long, longer term technology will uh, will obviously continue that trend. And in terms of who does it, uh, on the on average of about two to two and a half days a week are information technology, finance, professional business services. At a half a day a week are retail, transportation, warehousing, hospitality, and food service, as you can imagine. Uh, any questions? Uh, sorry for the long explanation. Deb always smiles. Oh, Madam Chair always smiles at me. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to give you the big hook thing. Thank you. Uh, and thank you uh, for listening. And any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Peter. I appreciate the the report. Any questions or comments, Councilmember Chambliss? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Tab liaison, Mr. Dugan. That was very interesting to get those statistics and. Um, I, I know there's a lot more to it, and I intend to dig into it further. It's, it's very interesting to see how, uh, change, how fast change has accelerated and occurred uh, during the pandemic. So uh, it's very intriguing. Yes, and it's, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And I, I think Madam Chair always speaks a tab about trying to get a handle on where is transportation going this, you know, in the next three to five years uh, with 
with work from home and you know and the like and the uh, uh, full, uh, as I said the most the biggest ripple is the hybrids, the people that kind of come and go, not, they're not there all the time, and those are mostly uh, college graduates, higher paid, and professionals and managers. And um, I will also note that um, uh, um, Elaine, who staffs our tab meetings, um, did send out some information that Mayor Hovland had, and we can get it forward out to this committee as well. And I'd say there's a lot going on right now as we're prepping for the next regional solicitation, so there'll be lots of conversations as we move forward. So any additional questions or comments? Thank you very much, folks. Very good. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, next, we're on to our tech report. We have Daryl Paulson. Welcome. Uh, come to the side here a little bit. Uh, uh, hopefully, you can hear me in the back or if somebody can turn the mic for me. Can. Um, there you go. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Um, my name is Daryl Paulson. I'm the vice chair of TAC, which is the Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee. It is a committee that was mandated and legislated by the Met Council 31 years ago to look at our ADA accessibility um, compliance and, and how do we do things. And that includes uh, not only our transit system, but that includes our facilities, any, any, um, any other operations that we might operate in. Um, we, they need to be ADA compliant and inclusive. So with that, I'm here to give the May 3rd TAC report. And I will say um, TAC has been an interesting, um, it's been an interesting committee to be a part of. I've been a part of it nearly 20, almost 22 years. And I will say um, the members and the quality of committee members that we have on that committee advise the Met Council uh, very intentional, very, very um, thoughtfulness, and I I do appreciate the work that that we do together, and I do appreciate the updates that Tech has been able to give to to the TAB and to the Transportation Committee. I'm in the Transportation Committee, I believe, right? So uh, first of all, I want to bring you greetings from the Minnesota State Legislature. I um, we have. We have passed a almost a eight billion dollar transportation budget, and that is, as some of you said, transformative in in the way that we provide our transit services and the way that we move people around the region. And um, I actually never thought I would go up to the chair of the tax committee and tell and tell Chair Gomez that I was glad for the tax bill as well. <laughs> but I'm even more, more excited about the transportation bill. So I bring you greetings from both of the chairs, Chair Double and Chair, and Chair Horstein, as I continue with my report. So we gave a May, our, in our May update, um, we looked, I think it was earlier this month or last month, I was here a couple months ago. Since the time I was here, we've looked at a vehicle that would replace uh, 20 of our paratransit vehicles, um, and about six of us from the committee went down to the garage, and I'm sorry about that, and we looked at this vehicle, which is a minivan, and it's, we bought two of them, and we're scheduled to buy the other 18 soon. Um, the, I do understand the need for buying them because 70% of our folks that we transport on the paratransit system are ambulatory. So I do understand that that will be a little cheaper in gas. Um, however, I have a little bit of reservations about it because I, we were told that we recommended those vehicles to be stored inside. Um, that is only a recommendation that the Met Council can make, not a requirement. 
But I'm suggesting that if you have 20 minivans outside, you're not going to get the five to 10 years out of them that you would normally get out of them. Mm -hmm. So to store them inside would be something I recommend, mm -hmm. as well as I know some other folks on our committee, they're very excited about, um, they're excited about a couple things, but they really wanted to take this year and try to do some recognition of past tech members and past chair, chairmen and chairwomen. Um, so we're gonna look at that, as well as one of the initiatives that I brought forth with them uh, most recently is we're starting a partnership with um, the Minnesota State Fair. Typically the fair comes in and they talk to the tech committee um, in July, which is way too late to make any changes to the fair or how we get to the fair if we're using public transit or if we're even using the service like Lorenz or some of the other partners that we use. Um, so what I've suggested is that they come talk to us a little earlier. And because of that, um, we have the CEO and her team coming to meet with TAC um, next month so it's a little bit um, earlier than what we have done in the past. So, I, um, But the unique thing about that is I asked if it could be ongoing and if it could be year, uh, a year-round thing because a lot of folks that go to the state fair for different events throughout the year use our public transit system and they use our transit system to get there. So she said yes. So I, I'm excited to see what comes out of that over the next year or so. Um, some of the other things that we want to revisit is the priority seating <laughs> campaign that we, uh, um, that we did some videos. We did some videos on it and so forth. We want to bring that back up and see what we're, what we're doing about that. Um, another thing that came to our attention most recently is bus jumping. I don't know if you guys know what bus jumping is, but it happens a lot during, as the weather gets nice, and as we assume people with disabilities can, can go to the second bus, or even sometimes the third bus, and even I've seen four buses, depending on what time of day you are trying to get on a bus. Um, bus jumping is something that impacts people with disabilities tremendously. It affects people who are sight impaired, um, mostly, who have vision impairment. Bus tripping is when uh, the second bus decides to go around the first bus without docking in that first, in that home spot, they call it. I don't know if you guys call it a home spot, but when I read, when I read about it, I forget what it is, but it's that first spot that they're always supposed to touch or dock to before they pull out. And a lot of times, if, you're, if you've got two or three buses lined up, those, that second or third bus, they'll start to go around because that first bus is either loading somebody or unloading somebody. But it's really important to make sure that all your drivers know mm -hmm. to hit that, that first mark because they intentionally um, leave people behind mm -hmm. that are waiting there to board the bus. Um, so we'll talk about that in a more deeper conversation next month, and I can bring back more details on that. Um, other than that, I think we're really, I mean, we're really jiving together really well. Um, some of the things that I've, I've suggested that we bring a, a 12 month calendar so that we can see and we can chart our progress and we can match it up with the issues that, that you guys are talking about here in the committee or at the council. We can you know, align our priorities together. I'm very excited to see that the employee recognition was here um, tonight um, and I wish they would have stayed because I would have thanked them personally um, because as you know, last time I was here, I talked about 
a driver recognition program that TAC orchestrated earlier this year. And those drivers were mostly from the paratransit system, but we, but because I intentionally ride both systems, right, I made sure that we recognized the reservationist as well as a regular regular route service driver. Mm -hmm. So I, I intentionally will always recognize drivers and employees of our system um, when I'm able to. So thank you, Chair, for giving, giving, taking the time on this committee to do so. And I, I know that they, they'll love the plaque. They'll put it somewhere special. Hopefully none of them put it in their bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but if they do, that's okay too. But, so thank you with that. Um, I, I had some other things I wanted to tell you too. Some good news about the $8 billion, but I know Jed was gonna tell you it all, so I wasn't gonna <laughs> step on his toes. But some of the things that our committee talked about are coming to, to uh, tuition in this bill. Most importantly, and I had somebody else write down these numbers and check this so that I knew that it wasn't just my lack of sleep and being all excited. <laughs> so some of the things that we're going to get, get in this bill is driver operating training. And that's going to be on page 241.24, and it's going to go all the way to 242.3, OK? And then, then we talk about penalty for fare evasion. We hear about, we heard about how much we lost money during the pandemic and how we, we were trying to, trying to capture some revenues because of that. That is also going to happen with some really interest, interesting changes. Um, and that is on uh, page 179.27 all the way to uh, 180. Point 0.21, and then we'll talk about penalty for misconduct, and that is also there, and that is on page um, page 181. This is where the this is where the writing starts to get iffy. 181.11, and 181 all the way to 181.26. And these are all in the bill that just passed uh, last night before dinner time. So I got to go home and eat dinner, but I still didn't get home till 9.30. So I don't know what I was doing, but I was excited. So, and the other one is the Metro Mobility Appropriations. You know, I couldn't, uh, I had to go back and add, tell my people to add this one because I couldn't forget this one. And that is, um, that is in page, or yeah, page, or this might be a section, but that is section two, two 20.24 all the way to 20.26. So I believe that's in the first part of the bill, if, I, if my memory serves me right. And that's a very huge bill, but those are what, just four, five things I spoke about that I personally, my family's affected by, the people that I represent are affected by, the people that are at the Capitol, Capitol that said, hey, we're, we're excited to have, pass a $8 billion transit bill. Those are the people that spoke very loudly last night. Mm -hmm. So thank you. With that, I stand for questions. Thank it, you. Thank you so much questions. for your report. I really, really, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I think I didn't, do, I didn't do as good as Peter did. You guys are both rock stars. That's why we like it. So it's good. Um, I think that, you know, as we get our reports from, from Judd and all the legislative analysis, it'd be good to have um, them come to attack too. You know, kind of the, what does this mean? Like okay. that sort of next level. So um, 
I see Charles already taking notes for me. So, um, so but we'll make sure we'll do that. And um, before I turn it over for questions, I just want to say thank you for your comments about the employee recognition. And I'm so happy that you're doing that at TAC too. It's I, I don't think we can do that enough. And it's the yeah. favorite part of what we do here and um, by far. So I appreciate that. Thank much. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. That means a lot to, to me personally. And that means a lot to our committee. I know that it takes a lot of work to kind of do that and kind of filter filter out the, the best of the best or the, the ones that need the recognition versus the ones that, you know, will still work for you anyway, even if you don't recognize them. You know? <laughs> exactly. But, but the, the statistics show if you recognize somebody, you'll get about a year to, to 18 months out of them versus if you never said anything to them at all, you mm -hmm. don't. You don't get that that extra longevity that that we expect. So I mean, if it just goes a long way to say thank you, thank you for your willingness to serve on this committee. Thank you, members, for what you, what you do, and thank you for letting me be a part of it. Thank you, Chair. It's our pleasure. Are there any other questions or comments from council members? All right, I just have, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight two things then. Um, so I saw uh, Leslie frantically taking notes, talking about the bus jumping piece of it. So she will look into that, um, I'm sure, in very quick order. Um, also, I'm glad to hear you're going to have an ongoing conversation with the state fair um, because I would think getting the debrief after the state fair, almost that before, you know, it's a year out and we've forgotten and all of that where you get all the information to the right people ahead of time. Uh, I think that will be very, very helpful. Yeah, I do. I do really. I do. I'm really excited. Um, I, the the see the new CEO and I've had a couple conversations already, and a few emails going back and forth. She's bringing the accessibility um, um, specialist with her, and she's also bringing the operations manager with her as well. So it, it will be interesting to start that conversation. She actually approached me after I sent her an email and she said, oh, I read all about your committee. I, I want to work with you guys and I'm so excited about this. And so I was like, well, let's do this. Let's, you know, and so I'm, I'm excited because we typically engage the state fair through, through transit. So we usually wait until the so the bus operators want to talk to us, Lorenz particularly, and they they historically wait until the very last minute because they don't want to make any real changes. So this is really a different approach. And I was encouraged by David Finley, uh, the chair of TAC, and some other folks to, to do that. So um, I think we're on the right track. Very good. I did see we have a question. Um, Council Member Carter. You know what? And it isn't a question. It is really just a thank you. Your enthusiasm and vivacity and, and just mm -hmm. engagement and wealth of knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, not to mention your influence and impact and all of the work that you and you reflect the, the committee, you know, quite well are doing. It's just so impressive. Thank you so very much. And thank you to the committee. Yeah, I, I, we are really get the benefit of getting the reports both from TAC and from TAB. Um, there's a lot of work that gets done on all of these boards and things like that. And um, having these good reports and the chance to ask questions one-on-one -on -one is so helpful. Um, I will say our TAC group, um, this current committee has done a really great job and really um, uh, getting more involved, even, you know, to the point of not just bringing something that's an issue, but when we're looking at designing stops or we're looking at which minivans do we pick? Like we reach out to the people who will be using them because we have a good group of people who are willing to get involved and share their opinions. Yes, and just on a, on a um, more note, I don't. I think you've probably seen it, uh, Madam Chair, and you've probably seen it, Charles. Um, David would have been here, but he's at an ADA symposium conference, so he's doing the work of the great state of Minnesota, <laughs> and I'm sure he'll he'll, he'll be disappointed. To know that I gave a good, I gave a good report better than he normally does. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what I'm going to tell myself, and then I'll tell him to. I'll tell him that you guys all agreed because you laugh. <laughs> Perfect. I believe Mr. Dugan also had a comment. Yes, 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Derek. You wow. bet. I'm just glad I didn't have to follow you. You got more laughs than I did. I mean, come on. I, I just got to run back to the temple to catch my Metro mobility ride back home. Please Very good. Out. All right. So, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Peter, as well. Thank of you course. both. All right. Yeah, um, now, me. You, thank you so much. Now we're on to our business for the evening. Our first item is our consent agenda. There's two items on consent. I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent. So moved. Moved by Council Member Morales. Is there a second? Second. Uh, seconded by Council Member um, Cameron. Um, is there any other discussion? All, right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And the motion carries. And next we are on to our first non-consent item, which is business item 2023-95, a same week item, which is the Metro Gold Line Bus Rapid Contract Award. We have Steve Barrett here. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Barber and committee members. My name is Steve Barrett. I'm the Gold Line BRT Construction Manager, um, and I'll be presenting business item 2023-95, same week, for the Gold Line Wood Lane Park and Ride Construction Contract which is 22P425. Uh, this business item is same week because we needed to get approval from the Gold Lines Executive Change Control Board, or ECCB, prior to, be, prior to beginning and bringing this uh, to the council for approval. And we are eager to get this contract awarded and keep our Gold Line project on schedule. Um, So I believe many of you had an overview of the Gold Line BRT project back in March and probably other times, but as a reminder, what it is is frequent all-day service in primarily bus-only lanes. Uh, it has a projected budget of $505.3 million um, with new BRT stations and BRT-branded 60-foot buses. Uh, in addition to new surface park and rides, there's a new structure parking ramp in Woodbury at Wood Lane Drive. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, this park and ride is a three level ramp with 520 parking spaces, a driver facility space, storage for facilities, as well as a BRT station. It was designed to meet B3, which is the Minnesota Sustainable Building Guidelines. Uh, this contract was competitively bid. Uh, invitations for bids were issued back on February 28th of this year. We held a pre-bid meeting on March 31st. Um, there was a lot of interest from the contracting community. Uh, 62 plan holders, including 12 prime bidders and 26 plan holders who identified as women, minority, veteran, or disadvantaged business enterprises. Uh, in the end, the council received three bids, ranging from 18.3 million to 29.2 million. Uh, and Donler Construction submitted the low, responsive, and responsible bid. So a combination of federal funding through the Federal Transit Administration and local funding from Washington and Ramsey counties is incorporated into the council's authorized capital budget. The contract had a 16% DBE goal and the OEEO has determined that the recommended proposer has met the council's DBE contract requirements for the project. So therefore, uh, Donler Construction is being re recommended for award. We are requesting that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to award and execute contract 22P425 with Donler Construction for construction of the Metro Gold Line Bus Rapid Transit Wood Lane Park and Ride Facility in an amount not to exceed $18,312,000. If anybody has any questions, they can take them. Right, thank you, Steve. Questions or comments? Councilmember Chambliss. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I have a couple questions. One is related to uh, the building. Is Are there uh, solar panels or uh, environmental construction features? Uh, thanks. Thanks, committee member. Uh, there are none uh, incorporated into the contract as we're building, but it is being set up to accommodate future expansion for those kind of facilities, both for electric charging stations and for solar uh, power. It'll be capable of adding. Okay, thank you, Chair. And then my other question is related to the 26 um, plan holders that um, submitted uh, bids or inquiries, how did we get so many? <laughs> uh, and and what what is the strategy going forward to try and get so many 
competitive bids. How, how did we get so many? Well, we yes. had a pre-bid meeting, which is helpful. Um, we advertise and promote the project as best we can through some of the um, professional channels and the associated general contracting. So we, we do add that. Oh, sorry. Um, and then um, in addition, the, the 26 plan holders are, are companies that have purchased it. Some of them are suppliers. Some of them are subcontractors. So they're not all prime bidders. Okay, thank you. Okay, additional questions or comments? Uh, uh, Council Member Vento? I, I want to do a shout out to the staff as well as to the, the um, Washington and, and Ramsey County um, and the cities on the goal line. The, the commissioners representing um, the two counties have done a great job of really working through some complicated issues. And one of the, two of the really great advantages of this that doesn't have to do with the parking space, apologize, Steve, but two of the really big advantages that are gonna come for this area is that there will be an additional um, bridge across 94, and as well, there'll be a new and improved bridge over 694. And so for the people of Woodbury, Oakdale, and Landfall, it's gonna mean, um, in many respects, a quicker trip and a far safer trip. The one over 694, I, I don't use it if I can avoid it because it's almost a little bit scary. There's something about the angle and anyway, I, I don't know the proper words to describe it, but this, um, this project is gonna bring a lot of benefits. The work is advancing amazingly fast. Um, it just seems like every morning or afternoon when I'm going somewhere and I see how far they've gotten, I'm, I'm really impressed. And I, I just wanna do a, a shout out for the employees working on site. And I hope that as the summer progresses and the weather gets warmer, that our, our employees, all Met Council employees, but in particular our goal line um, construction employees, that they take good care. I, I always get nervous during extreme weather events, and I think we're going to have an extreme one this summer. So, That's a good point. I hope they uh, take good care. Yeah, and Mr. Kelby, I don't know if I skipped ahead if you had an additional um, answer for um, Councilmember Chambliss. Madam Chair, Councilmember Chambliss, a little bit more information on plan holders. So as Mr. Barrett indicated, there's a number of different um, interested parties that pick up the plans. There's a lot of businesses that market toward uh, creating different lists and pushing them out to different vendors, different contractors and consultants. And um, so they definitely don't represent a specific entity, but a plan room demonstrates uh, a consortium, if you will, of, of contractors that are interested in our, in our bidding opportunities, and then they push them directly to them. Councilmember Chambliss. Yes, um, thank you. So um, I do see that there were... I listed 27, I believe, subcontractors. Is there a breakdown in, um, for the DBE goal for um, each of those areas, or is it in total? I'm not sure how that works. Welcome, Mr. Payne. Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, the DBE goal is um, established using uh, what we call relative availability. So based on the scopes of the, that are associated with the work going on, a relative available DBE number is calculated and a goal is established. Um, I did not look at the exact DBEs who were awarded um, on this contract to know how the breakdown either demographically, but we can get that. Uh, information to the committee. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Uh, additional questions or comments from council members? <clears throat> All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-95, same week. So moved. Moved by council member Morales, seconded by council member Vento. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, and the motion carries. Thank you all. All right, we are on to our second uh, non-consent item, which is business item 2023-109, Master Contract for Construction Support Services, and we have Julie Brenny here. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Julie Brenny. I'm a senior project administrator within Engineering and Facilities Department of Metro Transit. 
Um, I use the pronouns she, her, and feel free to call me Julie. I am presenting business item 2023-109, master contract for construction support services, <coughs> contract 22P393. Master contracts are used within engineering and facilities for a number of disciplines. We also make the contracts available to other areas of um, Metro Transit. So the BRT office has used our contracts as well as the green line and blue line extensions. Um, they're used by staff for a wide variety of capital and operating projects and funding for the work is authorized and provided for within the within the projects. This procurement does replace previ a previous group of contracts which have expired. Um, the scope on this particular contract is primarily for independent cost estimate reviews, schedule reviews, and then supplementary construction support and oversight services. Um, the procurement was a Brooks Act procurement, which is a two-step process. An evaluation panel was selected and approved, and the panel discussed and debated the merit of the proposals, the proposals, and determined the proposal that was most qualified to complete the work. The panel selected Stantec Consulting Services as the most technically qualified proposal. After that, the cost proposal was received and evaluated by the negotiation panel, and then the negotiation panel agreed that the final negotiated prices are fair and reasonable. The Office of Equal Opportunity assigned a 10% DBE goal for this contract, and the last group of contracts did not have a goal, so this is a new um, opportunity for subcontractors to, to be used on this type of work. Um, this proposer has four DBE firms that they included um, as possible subcontractors for the work, so they're spreading the work around a bit too. Um, so we are requesting <clears throat> authorization to award one contract valued at up to $1 million over a term of five years. And with that, I can take any questions you may have. Very good, thank you, Julie. Uh, questions or comments? All right. Uh, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-109. So moved. Moved by Councilmember Morales. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Tony Carter. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And the motion carries. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Um, next, we are on to business item 2023-113. Uh, same week item is char charging and fueling infrastructure discretionary grant program. And we have Tony Fisher here. Welcome. Chair and committee members, nice to meet with you today. Uh, my name is Tony Fisher. I'm a transportation planner in MTS. I use he, him pronouns and feel free to call, ref call me Tony. So this is uh, an application that staff would like to submit to a, a federal program coming out of the um, Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act um, a couple years ago already. So just to show that where this fits into um, our draft vision, uh, we lead on climate change, um, electrification. This would um, this application, if awarded, would provide funds to the council to distribute to our partners, probably mostly cities and counties, but also other eligible um, partners, um, to install electric vehicle charging, um, probably fast charging and uh, level two charging. This um, charging and fueling infrastructure program is, uh, has uh, $2.5 billion over five years. Currently, what's available is two years worth of funding at uh, $700 million, and it's a uh, uh, federal share would be not to exceed 80%. The goals of the CFI program are to su supplement, not su supplement, not supplant necessary private sector investment in uh, electric vehicle charging, um, complement other existing federal programs, facilitate broad access to, to national charging and alternative fuel infrastructure that includes things like hydrogen and, um, and other fueling, whereas the, our application will be focused on electrification. Um, the goals include in implementing Justice 40 objectives, advancing job quality, workforce development, and workforce equity, 
and reducing, of course, re reducing greenhouse gases and vehicle-related emissions. So the, the funding opportunity is split into two parts. Uh, there is a community grants available and a corridor grant uh, program available. The funding is um, half in each, and they have a little bit different uh, focus and uh, particulars. But the community program is really um, available for um, any public location. Um, it, uh, the grants start at $500,000 and cap at $15 million. And this um, has a number of priorities, including rural areas, low and moderate income neighborhoods, communities with low ratio of private parking spaces to households, or a high ratio of multi-unit dwellings to single family homes. And the corridor grant program is really meant to fill out the alternative fuel corridors. In Minnesota, those are designated as I-35 and I-94. And within the Twin Cities, I-35E and 35W are um, included. Um, these grants start at a million dollars without a maximum. Uh, these would these need to meet the, the NEVI, National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, minimum requirements. And uh, specifically, these have to have four DC fast chargers at each location of at least 150 kilowatt, um, kilowatts each um, concurrently. So these, these are pretty significant investments. Um, current estimates are floating in the neighborhood of a million dollars each location. So MnDOT has a, um, an approved uh, plan for the, the NEVI program that will build out um, these charging stations at uh, less than 50 mile intervals and a little bit denser within the Twin Cities. And uh, what this application would do would allow our partners to build out a little bit denser network in the urban area where there's more usage, more, um, more important cross streets that we wanna serve and more just local, um, local electric vehicles where there's a lot of value in serving those. So the application that uh, we're putting together, um, we are designing the application to score well. So we're, we're reading pretty closely the notice of um, funding opportunities. Uh, we think there are opportunities to, to broadly serve the region, um, urban parts and uh, rural parts and in between. Uh, we're, we've got a, an eye on really accelerating electrification um, to capture those um, public health and climate benefits. And uh, we think this is an opportunity to, to go after some significant funds. Our current estimate is that we would be asking for $25 million in the corridor program and uh, $15 million in the, the uh, neighborhood program. We have been coordinating with partners. We are asking MnDOT and uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to provide letters of support. Uh, and we have uh, had a request out to, to cities and to uh, provide um, suggested locations just to help us with the application. Um, if awarded, we would be doing, uh, we would start from scratch with a solicitation um, and a call for um, applications. So we do have uh, support of Great Plains Institute with this application. Um, we are aware of other applications um, from Minnesota and we are coordinating with a number of them. And uh, this is a same week item because uh, the due date for the application is before the not Wednesday's council meeting, but the subsequent council meeting. Um, if awarded, it's a significant amount of work to, to run this um, solicitation, and we've got uh, deadlines in, in the funding opportunity to, to meet. Um, so council policy does require um, your approval to apply for funds over $500,000, and uh, that's why I'm here. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Tony. Questions or comments? Um, Councilmember Pacheco. Madam Chair, I was looking at page uh, three of the, the um, PowerPoint here, and, and number five was advanced job, ec job quality, workforce development, and workforce equity. How are you measuring that, and how are you setting the goals for workforce equity, for example? So these are the, the goals of the program. In the application, we, don't, we, we won't need to have everything figured out. We'll have to meet those, their requirements and uh, we'll have to put together a competitive application. So, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't have a lot of detail on that. Is that, Madam Chair, is the, um, the goal established by the funding source or is that something that we, that we have to respond to or do we set it out based on what we our design and, and uh, intent. So uh, 
Chair and Council Members, the, the program has requirements that we'll have to meet and it has um, selection criteria that we're, we're gonna try to strive for. And then um, after awarded, we'll, we'll have some room to maneuver and make decisions afterwards. So um, we just haven't gotten into a lot of details on that, but that is part of the program. Mm. Okay. Additional questions or comments? Council Member Cameron. Um, so my understanding is that this is for personal use vehicles, um, correct? For Chair and council members, I think that's uh, the primary audience, but I think we want to keep an eye on the opportunities to support um, medium duty vehicles, um, transportation network companies, you know, other other uses. Of yeah, and, and that's exactly where I was going to go with this, to also include those um, other entities that are using um, these corridors, as well as potentially coordinating with Metro Transit staff about future planning for our own corridors um, and alignments and making sure that if we're purchasing uh, vehicles that you know we are um, one arm of our um, uh, body is communicating with another arm and so that we are setting up these charging stations to where that they are also convenient to our own services that we provide as well. So that's one consideration to also keep in mind in addition to um, making sure that we're um, getting as much utilization out of these charging stations as possible. So um, that was one uh, one piece I wanted to mention. Um, the other was really, um, could you talk a little bit more about um, engagement with local partners? Because I think that's going to be a really important next step in the process. Um, and there would be a lot of local partners interested in this. So could you talk a little bit more about what work has been done thus far? and? Um, what your plan is should you be awarded. Chair and, Chair and Council Members, if I can go back to your first comment. Um, yeah. 60% of greenhouse gases in the transportation sector come from light duty vehicles. And so mm -hmm. that's um, really the focus of the program. Um, we've definitely had help from Metro Transit staff on putting this together because um, I've never submitted a federal application for funds. So that's, that's been really helpful. Um, I think the opportunity for um, coordinating with other parts of the council may lie in smaller vehicles than 40-foot mm -hmm. um, buses and other things. Um, but um, in terms of engagement, um, we, we've we met with a, um, with a MnDOT and um, a coalition representing St. Paul and Minneapolis that are proposing to, to submit applications. We, um, we did send out a, a, a .gov email to, I believe it went to all city managers and county managers in the region. And then we also used uh, a few uh, more targeted lists of people that are more involved in electrification and, and climate type work. Um, so we've had those, some of those conversations, we're getting some of that feedback. And then I think if, um, if we were awarded funds, I think um, really the, the center of that engagement, I, I would foresee this looking a little bit like the regional station um, and it would, um, you know, it would benefit from a lot of discussions through the tab TAC process. Okay. All right. Additional questions or comments? Uh, General Manager, um, sorry, Director Carlson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, I think this is really a great program and that leverages the council's scale in going after a, like a full regional application for these federal funds and then making it available to uh, local communities who would then bring the 20% matching funds. So the council's role in this is really to convene and to pursue those federal funds and then to make the federal funds available for others to match. So uh, without <clears throat> significant cost to the council, really just the cost of administering the program, uh, we could potentially bring, uh, you know, another, yet another transformative clean energy opportunity, in this case, not so much on the transit side, uh, but on the on the um, highway side of, of uh, planning for the region. Uh, to, the, to the point of transit facilities, you know, this, this typically wouldn't be for people who are using transit, but there are a lot of park and ride locations that are very well positioned for vehicle charging. They're near the interstate system. Uh, they, they have significant uh, land available. They may have good infrastructure opportunities. Certainly those could be looked at or proposed on. Uh, although they'd probably be sort of the plug in, charge up, and leave again, as opposed to plug in and get on a bus all day uh, type uses. But that's that's what we'll work through with local communities. 
Any additional questions, comments? All right. Very good. Then I'd entertain a motion to approve business 2023-113 same week. So moved. Moved by Council Member Tony Carter, seconded Second. by Council Member Tyrone Carter. Um, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And the motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Um, next, we are on to 2023-111, which is the 2040 TPP administrative modification. We have Cole Henniker. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, I'm Cole Henniker, uh, senior manager of multimodal planning. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I am here today to talk about uh, the proposed action that the council approve uh, TPP modification administrative modification to establish a transitway policy for transitway projects requesting a change to the TPP. I'm going to start by telling you what is an administrative modification. So it's not an amendment to our plan. It's not changing any projects. Um, it's not changing funding in the plan. It's just establishing a different policy for how projects enter the TPP. So any future projects requesting a change to the TPP for a transitway would be required to follow this policy, but there are no projects affected by this specific action. Um, we, we developed this policy in response to, or this, this amendment in response to a policy that was adopted last year. So some of you council members maybe weren't around for that. Uh, but that policy established both internal direction for how we're going to review and, uh, and evaluate transitway projects moving forward. One of the requirements of that policy was to establish this policy in the TPP. And so this action is really a follow-up from that business item last fall, which is referenced in the business item. Um, we developed this actually uh, through a couple different uh, venues for engagement. We worked with both a transit technical working group, which includes staff from local governments, from all the transit providers, so they all had a chance to review it. Um, we also took it through TAB's technical committees for review, and we're going to take it to TAB next month. We just happened to run out of time this last month. Um, so we've had plenty of feedback. We had meetings specifically with, with Transitway sponsors to make sure they were comfortable with the proposed language in the attachment. So a pretty robust uh, policy, even though there is no formal public comment uh, requirement for this type of action, uh, we did engage with a lot of the stakeholders who are interested in this, this policy, particularly those that have a transitway project that's actively under study. Um, the only other thing um, that I wanted to mention was um, that this is it's obviously just the first step. There's other procedures that are still being developed. In fact, Nick Thompson, who I think is here, is, is going to be working through those. Those are not going to come to the council for formal adoption because they're more like standard operating procedures. Um, so this is the last major action you'll see until we get a transitway request to make a change, of which case you know, that we'll revisit this policy and remind you all what we're asking for. So it's a pretty brief uh, modification. It's two pages that you can see in the attachment. Uh, the really important points for you to look at um, are the, the bolded sections on the attachment that just state the kinds of things we're looking for when we ask transit ways to come forward. Um, none of this is really new. Uh, we've always asked for this information. We're really just documenting that it's, it's now the official policy in place. It was, is, it was sort of a working, uh, in informal policy before. So the, the four requirements are the documentation of the transitway alignment, uh, station locations, uh, mode, uh, the, the resolutions of support from local government bodies that say we support this project coming to our community, a documentation of fiscal constraint to show that the project sponsors know where the project's going to be funded from, and then a documentation of public engagement and feedback. You know, what did you hear as you were developing the project? So those are the four things we ask for when projects come forward. And you can expect if you see a transitway project coming forward that you'll get all of that information presented to you in order to make your best decision about how to uh, address that project in the, T T uh, in the TPP. So with that, I uh, would welcome any questions, but otherwise um, would ask that you uh, approve the proposed action. Thank you. Are there questions or comments? Council Member Chambliss. Um, yes, um, it's, it's nice to um, see how the transitway advancement policies process is unfolding. My question is regarding um, the bullet on resolutions of support. Um, how is that going to work? Is that a process step or a requirement um, in terms of is there a certain percentage of support that is needed or 
uh, that's part of the process for us to ensure that our local communities are engaged and have a chance to weigh in. You want me to address that, Madam Go Chair? Ahead. Yeah. So, generally speaking, we look for unanimous support along the corridor from all local governments that would be where the project travels through. Um, so we don't want to we don't want to be building a project that someone doesn't want in their community. Um, there has been instances recently where communities have said, we don't want this, and so we've gone back to the drawing board and, and re-scoped re the project to a project that we think all the local sponsors would support. So we're generally looking for that full support, and we usually ask for it at the completion of the planning stage. Usually that's led by a county or a transit provider, and that information, all of those resolutions should be adopted before you guys take action. So you'd be saying, you know, do we have all of the governments in support of this project before we're acting? Um, and if I may, we just notice something in the business item. So in those bullet points, the first one should read documentation of transit way mode alignment and station locations and selection process. So we'll make sure um, as um, it goes to the full council. So if you look down below in blue, that's that should be that first bullet. Um, so I will show you if it makes sense. Um, so uh, next to uh, Council Member Vento. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my first introduction in terms of a steeping sort of way um, to transportation was as a member of the work group that worked on this policy plan. And it was a, a phenomenal learning experience for me, but already prior to that I had learned a lot about the politics of, of transportation planning and what can happen at the community level. Um, the um, Purple Line um, has gone through um, two rounds of challenges, and it, it really motivated me to be a part of this conversation, and I really appreciate the work that's been done so that we can identify risks and really assess the risks in advance of committing the council long-term and trying to work through those with risks with our, our county and, and city partners to get them resolved so that going forward we don't have nightmares for us or future councils. So I think this has a great benefit today and well into the future in terms of, of cautious planning and just making sure we've got all our I's dotted and T's crossed. Transportation planning takes a long, long time. The purple line, the conversations on the purple line started back in the 90s and we had our groundbreaking was it last fall? Yeah, last fall. It was cold. <laughs> to stop and think of what was the temperature. And then we had that FTA check presentation a few weeks ago. So it just shows you how long these processes take. And one of the risk factors that occurs during a 20-some period, year period of time is a lot of city and county elections. Mm -hmm. And the cast of character and a lot of turnover with the Met Council, the cast of characters can change. So to the extent that we can be really um, thorough and thoughtful in this, I think it will it is paying dividends already. So thank hey, you. Thank you for your comments. Council Member Chambliss. Well, yeah, I and think um, Council Member Vento, I think that is really getting to the point of why I'm asking this question. And then I'm going to follow it with a question and then um, make a comment. So my question is, in terms of historically where we have asked for resolutions of support, uh, what types of projects are those or have those been on um, for the transit way advancement um, applications? Are they similar or is it going to apply to um, more types of projects? And I'm asking that question because um, when you, when you ask for resolution of support with 100% agreement or 100% consensus, uh, that actually could slow a process down. Uh, if a project takes uh, 10 years or 20 years or 40 years to build and you require a resolution of support throughout that process, I think there's some considerations that need to be made because you could actually be going back and asking for resolutions of support multiple times for especially for those larger projects. Um, yeah. uh, I, I can uh, clarify one yeah, point no, no, and, and then I'll let you comment. speak. So we do, we do, this requirement only applies to the step in which they're asking for a change in the TPP. So if the project is making other minor changes, there's no requirement to revisit those resolutions. However, if, if a corridor is 
proposing a significant shift in the mode or the alignment, and it only, if well, the mode wouldn't, but the alignment only affects one community, we only go back to that one community and ask them for their, for their renewed support. You know, so we wouldn't go back to like St. Paul if none of the stations in their community are changing in any kind of amendment. So it is really just to confirm this project has gone through a long planning process. You've been at the table the entire time. Can we confirm that you are fully supportive of what's being proposed to be amended into the TPP? And it only happens you know, once or twice in a project's development process. To date, I would say it hasn't really held up any projects in terms of timeline. Um, and I was just going to see Charles. I, I don't know if we specifically asked for these on A, B, or T in the past, but that would be the practice moving forward. It would be the practice moving forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Correct. The policy is directed both at internal projects and other projects done with um, external funding partners. Um, so it is is kind of a new process. Um, this you're, the likelihood of 100% of everyone agreeing is 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 unlikely in general, and I think that's part of what our role as council members and, and the other bodies who look at TPP modifications and amendments, that's part of the job, right, to look at those things. There's other steps down the road for bigger projects like municipal consent and some of those other things, which which tie in different processes. So um, it's, it's but this is one piece of it. Um, I believe uh, council member uh, Tony Carter, you had your hand. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, good discussion and questions regarding um, the likelihood of 100% support, which is typically not. <laughs> but I did want to ask a question about the support that you received from those from whom you requested input on this particular policy change. Um, you do indicate that local governments involved indicated appreciation for your reaching out and responding to and including your suggestions were there any standout issues um, that did not receive unanimous support? Um, Madam Chair, if I can, uh, council members, the, I would say the most of the concerns raised were more nomenclature, um, just wording choices. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, most of these, including the resolutions, these have all been in place informally before this. Yeah. So that people were used to this, they're used to these practices, it was just writing it down and making sure we all agree on how we say it, the things that we're already doing. So uh, in generally, we, we've had strong support and appreciation for the outreach that we did. And I would say in the transitway corridors, it has been unanimous support, but resolutions of support. We have not added a corridor to the TPP without mm -hmm. these resolutions of support in place. Um, and in fact, one great example was Gold Line, which is the project that received the, the check recently from the feds. Um, they originally it was going to go to Lake Elmo yeah. and Lake Elmo pulled their support and we shifted it to Woodbury. Well, Woodbury really wanted the project. Mm -hmm. And so that was a good change for us to say, you know, Lake Elmo doesn't want it. Woodbury does. Let's revisit that project location and alignment mm -hmm. and let's make a project that they support. So I think that's the way the process is supposed yeah. to work. If someone doesn't mm -hmm. support it, let's revisit the options and make sure that we can get a project everyone does support. It's helpful not to be stuck in process and unable to make an adjustment. Mm -hmm. uh, Director Carlson, and then I have some comments. Yeah, and Madam Chair, thank you. Just to also to clarify that it's it's not every every vote of every community that there's no dissent. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the bar. The bar is an indication or a resolution of support from each community as a whole. Right. Uh, so often it has, you know, there have been times where it's been narrowly in favor and then it switches to narrowly opposed and that we've has seen. created issues for the council uh, as, as we've sought to move projects forward. So just to clarify, it's every community, not every Indeed. vote <laughs> and not every, uh, uh, everybody casting a vote. All right, um, council member Cameron. Um, I, I just wanna add that as a new council member, I really appreciate this modification as it adds in uh, more investment in our planning processes on the front end uh, and and taking away from challenges later on done a project. And so I really appreciate this type of modification and um, the work that is going into making sure that we are as prepared as possible as we're um, uh, building out new projects. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, Council Member Pacheco. Yeah, Madam Chair, maybe it's just does, it's apples and oranges, but if we're looking at 100% you know, uh, buy-in on some of these things, how does that impact what we're looking at as far as uh, uh, bus stops? 
our, our other locations of facilities? Do we expect to get 100% support? And if we don't, do we just go down the block? Well, um, Madam Chair, again, to reiterate what Charles said, it's not 100% support for every <laughs> element of the project. It's, it's city by city. It's making sure the, whole, the city is supportive overall of the project. You know, they might have their issues here and there, but if they say we're okay with those because we want the big, the larger project to succeed, um, that's how we typically go. And I would just remind you all, too, that these cities are at the table throughout the entire planning process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're weighing in well before we get to this step of resolutions of support. And it's up to the project sponsors, who are often you know, counties or transit providers, or, to make sure that the cities are comfortable with the project they're planning before it ever gets to this step. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, if we get to this step, you know, that's part of the risk assessment piece for us. Have the cities been engaged yeah. throughout this entire process? Do we expect any pushback when we get to this step? Let's make sure not to get to this step mm -hmm. unless we're already checked those boxes off. All right, additional questions or comments? So just uh, I'll add my little narrative to this commentary to this all. So part of the reason we adopted this policy was to really change kind of at a fundamental level how we're advancing projects. It isn't necessarily to say no to projects, but um, typically, at least in my experience, I've been, this is my ninth year on council, um, there were base requirements that were met, and then a project was modified into the TPP. Mm -hmm. um, then there's another step once it becomes a project that became a Met Council project where the project office was under us for like some of the bigger transitway projects. Um, obviously, we internally do all the ABRT lines, but um, it's, it's, some of those questions that you're asking, like when you talk about public engagement, so something came to us to say, we've done all, we've checked all our boxes for the TPP, we could look at it and say, no, we as a council think you need to go out and talk to these communities some more, or you're missing this piece of the engagement, um, or you know, um, we're not sure that your ridership models are a thing, whatever it is, that we can push back to some of the, the um, partners that we have to make sure, not that we're saying no, but that we've had the project developed to the right point so that we're advancing it, you know, with a really sort of smart and more, um, I think, more uh, uh, defined process that I think is good for us and ultimately will be good for our funding partners too. But it is a change in how we do this. So, but this, uh, the planning part's the first step. So this is really kind of a big thing that we're doing today. So um, any additional questions, comments? Maybe just one more note, um, Madam Chair, that the, this policy would naturally flow into the 2050 TPP, which is under development. And I'm not entirely sure that we're going to see a project get requested ahead of the 2040 TPP, or the 2050 TPP. So you might not see this policy actually implemented until a year from now when we get something like Blue Line Extension or Purple Line Amendment coming forward. Um, so just a heads up, you might not see this policy uh, in play or used for a little while. Um, but just uh, know that we're, we're getting well ahead of the projects requesting this change to give them plenty of time to prepare any information they need to. And thank you. All right, I appreciate the discussion, everyone. Um, with that, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-111. So moved. Moved by Councilmember Vento. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Cameron. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Plus nay, motion carries. Thank you. Um, with that, we are done with our business for the evening. Um, I would say that um, items one and three are both same week, so they would go non-consent to the full council, but the other two items can go on the cons consent agenda without objection. Okay, very good. Then we are on to our information items. Our first is the FTA DBE program semi-annual report. We have Trina Bolton and Ashante Payne here. Good evening, council members. Ashanti Payne, Assistant Director for the Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity. And I'm here with Trina Bolton to present our first half of our FTA DBE report, which is based on the federal fiscal year. Um, we submit uh, semi-annually to FTA um, a progress on our DBE achievements uh, during the federal fiscal year once in June, and then again, um, after the fiscal year concludes September 30th, uh, we submit again in December, which is our final uh, report with our final uh, stats that we get uh, assessed on from the FTA. Um, 
we like to bring these uh, to the Transportation Committee before we get uh, submit the report um, and it becomes official um, so that uh, council members and the public is aware of, uh, of our progress and of, of our actions. Um, I will also say that we are in the last year of our current triennial period um, and we are in the process of working with a third party to do the methodology and an analysis for our next triennial period and next goal. Um, this, and that will be the first in the council's history that we have gone outside um, and had an independent party um, do that assessment. We have historically uh, done it in-house. Uh, so with that, um, I will turn it over to Trina to present um, the first half uh, report results. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, can I have the... Oh. Thank you. So this is just a basic overview of the DBE program. So uh, the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program is administrated, administered for federal, federal funds. Um, it is utilized for construction and architectural <coughs> and engineering and professional and technical contracts. Um, the annual goal is established, as Ashanti mentioned, every three years, so it's currently 14%. Um, the project-specific goals are established by the small business unit for each contract. And then report of utilization is, again, reported in June and December semi-annually. And then the achievement is against the 14% goal. So the DBE utilization um, is currently... Um, for total spend um, on this report was 19 million, a little over 19 million. And for the total to, of DBE contracts to primes was about 204,000. Um, the subcontractors were awarded about approximately 2.1 million. And then the total spend to DBE firms was a little over 1 million. So this reporting period, we actually had a shortfall of about 6.5%. We were short of our 14% goal. So in regards to the awards to DBE firms, about 49 million or, or 49,000 um, was awarded to black American firms. Uh, 7,360 was awarded to Native American firms. Uh, 36,000 was awarded to Asian Pacific American firms, and then 1.152 million was awarded to non-minority female firms. So this is the distribution of um, DBE dollars awarded to the different firms. Um, 13 female non-minority firms were awarded contracts, and then two uh, Asian American firms were awarded contracts, and then uh, one contract was awarded to black Americans and one was awarded to Native Americans. So some of the major contracts that were awarded was the Fast Fair Upgrade contract 22P408 in the amount of about $6 million. And out of the spend, it was about 31.38 of the spend on this uh, reporting period. There was zero uh, DBE goal on this contract or commitment. Um, it was purchased directly from a vendor, so there was no opportunity for DBEs to participate on the contract. Um, the next one was a master contract for a Bass Lake Spur freight rail maintenance, and the contract had was about four million, a little over four million, and there was a 10.2 percent commitment. The next one was OHB hoist replacement, and the amount was 1.2 million with a DBE commitment of 18.78 uh, DBE participation. Of the 29 prime contracts, 12 contracts had DBE subcontracting opportunity of about 8.6 million, and 17 contracts had no subcontracting opportunity of 10.5 million, which is why there was a shortfall this reporting period. Um, some of the successes on these contracts, uh, the three different female firms were, Caucasian female firms were awarded prime contracts and then one Native American firm, one black American male firm, and uh, two Asian Pacific male firms were awarded contracts. And then uh, in regards to process improvement, I'm gonna hand it to Ashanti. 
Thank you. Um, yes, in terms of some of the initiatives and process improvements we've made, um, specifically targeted outreach, um, where we have identified where we have gaps, we have conducted targeted outreach to those groups um, to uh, identify businesses that can perform and participate in contracts with the council. Um, we continue to conduct meet and greet sessions, both on a uh, group meet and greets and individual basis. So individuals um, who request uh, connections or uh, introductions to decision makers and business units with, with the council, we uh, coordinate that with our procurement office and the business unit and conduct those meet and greets. Um, Mentor Protege has also been a successful initiative in terms of uh, pairing certified small businesses with larger, longer established businesses to build capacity, work on specific aspects of their business to help them position themselves to compete more effectively for uh, council procurements. Um, we've made some adjust adjustments to our contract initiation uh, process and our goal setting um, process um, to gather information about the project um, ahead of time um, and to uh, assess uh, other opportunities and other tools that can be used um, to get participation from our certified small business. Um, we've, all, we've also um, developed a new engagement and development unit in the Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity um, that we um, feel will help us uh, stretch our impact beyond just regulatory and compliance efforts um, into um, engagement, outreach, um, technical assistance um, and supportive services to small businesses. Um, and we are in the process of filling the last FTE uh, for that team, so um, they will be fully operational and uh, definitely um, excited for the help. Um, we also have a new data team that we've been looking at um, to improve our overall small business reporting um, that we report on both for our MCUB and DBE um, to provide um, better, um, better information, um, be able to tell better stories, um, and to automate certain processes that have been manual for uh, quite some time. Um, and then we are also uh, working with procurement um, and finalizing a master contract um, that will be used to provide, uh, to contract with third parties to provide, again, technical assistance, support services, access to resources to small businesses, um, again, to build capacity and, and position them uh, to compete for success. Any questions? Thank you. Um, at first, Councilmember Chambliss and then Pacheco. Oh, thank you. This um, report is very much appreciated, and I've been waiting for this for quite, quite a while to see um, um, what what has been happening in terms of the success of the program, as well as uh, it's good to see what the process improvements have been and the plans going forward to um, to make it uh, make it even better. Um, what is helpful for me is to see trend more trend information. So looking at um, what what the reporting stats were uh, in the prior year period as well as pre-pandemic reporting, just to kind of see wh where we would probably maybe want to get back to, or perhaps we're in some cases, maybe we're doing even better, you know, um, than we were pre-pandemic, especially with the improvements. But that would help me kind of get to do a comparison and understand you know, <clears throat> exactly where we've come from and, and where we might need to go. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Council Member. Uh, yes, we will take that and make sure we have trend info. Um, just from my own recollection, um, so last federal fiscal year um, for 2022, we achieved 18.22% in our DB program. Um, from what I told, that's the highest that we've, we've been at. Um, prior to that, uh, we just barely made our goal in 2021, which was 14.02%. Um, and then, um, so then 2020, um, it was 14%. However, we had a 15% goal um, that year. So we, there was a shortfall, and we had to do a shortfall analysis and submit to 
um, FTA. And I also will say um, this is a challenge, but we're still hopeful um, for the second half that we can make up and still achieve our goal for the year. Um, so we're, we're, we're still going to be working hard. But we will uh, make sure that that trend info is clear and uh, precise uh, when we present this information. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd also, we get quarterly reports on the MCUB spending um, at our um, uh, management committee. And our last meeting was two weeks ago. Um, and we had a great summary. And so I think it's good to see both sides of this because this is one piece of all of that. Um, same thing, we've had some successes and some challenges, I think. But um, you can definitely, there's some, I think we had some historical data in that um, report as well. So it'll probably be worthwhile taking a look at that. Um, so Council Member Pacheco and then Vento. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, a couple things, one is uh, Mr. Payne did attend our equity committee uh, the other day. Um, made this report. We had some good conversations of what we could do as, a, as an equity committee uh, to support the efforts that, that they're doing now and some of the outreach I see, you know, with the Latino community and others that uh, we can make some headway on. Uh, but even backing up before that is that um, when uh, it was, that we are in the process, or we had an uh, RFP out there to look at how we how we're going to analyze our our current program. What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? What are how do we compare to others? This is as as it was expressed is the first time we went outside on this. I looked at the RFP, and there's some great information in there that I think will be very helpful. We can even share that uh, as well. And so I think that was a good an, uh, uh, effort, and as, as Mr. Payne expressed, that the, it's a good, it, he thought there was a very positive uh, movement for him and his staff. Um, I think also is that we had a, actually a good example of how this all works. Uh, uh, Council Mayor Wolf was at, the, at our equity committee talking about uh, this, now I probably got it all wrong, it's an environmental program we're looking at to clean up the uh, extension from the house to the, to the sewer uh, and some of the old, old uh, um, piping that's there. And, uh, and right after that, uh, Mr. Payne came up and we talked about, well, how many contractors that we have that could do that work? Uh, and, and they went back after, and I, I contact them after, and they, they're ready to look at the number um, and look at how they can work with them. And so I think that kind of stuff has to happen um, across the company or across this, the council. Um, even um, what we're doing with the blue line or the green line extension, we now we have the number of employees we've had, how many, where, how, and as far as how many, how many were uh, utilized during the course of the year. And it's, it's those things that when I come to the meetings, we, we see pieces of it, and, and often enough we need to really have this kind of more complete re, uh, report. They're doing good work. We have uh, adding to his team, uh, and uh, he has agreed uh, to come to our, our monthly meetings and just to give a quick update on, on what they're doing. I think that's a great point, and that's why I mentioned the management committee. I mean, we're, we all represent different committees, and I think it's important that we all have these experiences and, and so to bring those things up. And I think that, you know, like you look at the workforce goals with the Green Line Extension and why we have those versus DBEs and, and CUBs and how we're trying to do all these different things, what's working, what's not. But we all have different pieces of it from the committees we represent. So, you know, that's really part of the conversation we, I think, like to have to make us be a little more cross-functional. Yeah. Um, all right, um, Council Member Vento, and then I believe uh, Tony Carter. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd qu really quirky question, but I'm gonna ask it because I'll think about it for the rest of the night. Um, do we have a sense either here in the metro region or in Minnesota, or has the FTA provided any kind of information as to the extent that that the pandemic and or the economic hurdles that we've experienced, <coughs> particularly as it relates to employment challenges and, and recruiting workers, how much that may be contributing to the challenges that that we as a council have faced in terms of meeting our goals? Madam Chair, Council Member, um, the only work that I'm aware of, and there could be others, um, as part of MnDOT's uh, triennial goal setting process, they added to their uh, contract and did a survey mm -hmm. of uh, how the pandemic has impacted and, and, and what some of those impacts were to small business. Um, so um, I have reached out um, to MnDOT mm -hmm. and also 
Um, the other part of it is uh, Dr. Myers in the University of Minnesota who's doing our uh, study also did MnDOTs. Mm -hmm. um, he agreed to um, help us put together survey questions mm -hmm. if we so desired and wanted to do that uh, component as well. Um, Madam Chair, Ashanti, thank you. I, um, as, as you both work on this, if you come across any of that kind of information, I'd be interested, and I think the rest of the committee and frankly the council would be, um, I mean, any time you go through a, an, an historic event like the pandemic, the lessons learned are sometimes priceless. And, and um, just that realization, I think, would be good for us to have. Thanks. All right, uh, Councilmember Carter. Thank you. Yep. Um, the information that you've shared has been very, very helpful, and also understanding your, your verbal comments regarding past achievement. Um, I do know that we're in the process then right now of goal setting for 2024 and beyond the three-year process. Um, I just want to be real careful to understand we are setting our goals. Is that correct? Or are these imposed goals that are set for us by FTA? Thank you, Madam Chair, Council Member. Um, the FTA doesn't impose a number goal. Um, they impose um, how you establish uh, the, the, the goal setting okay. process and then they approve what we submit to them. So we are um, coming up with it. Um, we're proposing what we think it should be based on the market, et cetera, all those mm -hmm. factors. And then they come back and say, Yes, you did it according to our method. It meets our standards, and yes, you're approved. And then also, um, uh, Trina and her colleagues also set project-specific goals okay. to right. get us to that overall goal. That's helpful. And as you work internally to negotiate that process with the FTA or to come up with the goal, Will you be sharing with us that criteria that you're using and the logic that you're applying in setting the goal and proposing it to FTA? Yes, um, very good question. Um, <clears throat> one of the things, our goal actually, that is one part of our administration of program that does uh, require council approval. Um, but after the base goal is established, um, the methodology, logic, those things will be shared um, and there's a mandatory uh, comment period. So we will hold uh, public comment. Um, we've also identified that we're gonna go to the EAC at that point, um, get, get their comment and feedback. Um, and of course, uh, the council will have a chance to um, uh, understand it, comment, um, and the regulations say that it can't just be pro forma, that you have to explain how those comments during the comment period were either addressed, utilized, or implemented. Right, thank you. Very helpful. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And finally, I did hear you say that you will be going to the EAC. Are there others who are involved with us in setting, uh, reviewing, and determining how our goal process and the achievement of our goals is going, what, what we should be doing in that regard. In other words, do we have people out in the contractor community who are regularly engaged with us, others in the community who are engaged with us on a regular basis as we set these goals and work toward achieving them? Yes. Um, and uh, having been that this is this will be my first time since at the council that we've gone to a well this is the first time a council has gone uh, external so um, I will say most of my experience in terms of how uh, these groups are involved comes from when I was at MnDOT so um, okay. so I will say they are um, very much interested in what each of our agencies are doing in terms of establishing the goal um, uh, the AGC regularly puts out a some sort of document or, or something in response, and they're definitely uh, attend those public hearing okay. uh, sessions. 
uh, contractor associations, mm -hmm. so the National Association of Minority Contractors, Association of Women Contractors, mm -hmm. um, often provide their own briefs or, or responses. Mm -hmm. um, small business, part of, part of it is, is talking in, in what Dr. Myers' teams will talk to small businesses, he'll talk to the, the large contractors, he'll talk to folks here at the council who administer the program. So yes, it is part of that process. Mm -hmm. And thank you for indulging those questions. I'm very interested to hear from you uh, periodically how those communities have been engaged and as we're moving forward to set this next goal, you know, how, how we've actually processed that input. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, any additional Council Member Carter? Yeah, uh, uh, it's kind of related. So I was interested that you, you talked about an engagement and development unit. Are you going to provide like an overview, like a walkthrough, what that process is like typically? Madam Chair, Council Member, um, yes, we can do that, or we can have um, the manager uh, come to this committee and talk about um, that process. They have a strategic plan that they've been working on, um, and that that they will get. Uh, um, measured on, um, and we can certainly have them come back and, uh, or come to this uh, committee and talk about their strategic plan and that process. Thank you. And I, I would say sometimes we've got agendas planned out for a series of time when, if you can't tell, our agendas get pretty big. So if you need additional information before that, uh, reach out to Shante and Trina, and they can certainly connect you so you can get the information in a shorter time period. So, um, because, yeah, we... Sometimes it, it might take a few times before we can get something on an agenda. All right, additional questions, comments? All right, thank you guys very much. And we are gonna, we have one more information item. We're gonna have um, Brian Funk and Adam Harrington come up. Um, we will kind of get as far as we can get and they're gonna give us a quick run through. We may invite them back for June 12th meeting, but we have some good news. So I would really like for them to have an opportunity to present to us. Uh, good morning, or good morning, uh, good afternoon, <laughs> uh, almost uh, Now evening. you feel how all of us yeah. feel at the end of the legislative <laughs> session. Right. Uh, Madam Chair and Council Members, uh, again, Brian Funk, uh, Deputy General Manager and Chief Operating Officer, uh, glad to be here. I'll get us started. Uh, we're going to share a few of the highlights, and uh, as Chair Barber indicated, we'll move quickly through this presentation, but feel it's really important to provide this uh, good news information for you uh, on the heels of a, a very great weekend. Uh, here at Metro Transit, for a number of years, we've been addressing what really is a national uh, driver shortage uh, locally. And so here within the Twin Cities, uh, even unlike some of the other major metropolitan areas, we've been uh, sort of grappling with a very low unemployment rate. Uh, that's good news for the local economy, but it can be tough to find a skilled workforce like we're looking for with bus operators. Uh, as you can see on this uh, snapshot from last week on uh, the Indeed website, there's more than 100 uh, bus driver jobs is the keyword search I used. Uh, thanks to our team, we're top of that and very prominent, uh, but it, we do have a lot of competition. And so we continue to work on that. Uh, illustrated in the second bullet is that the American Public Transportation Association took up a study last year uh, looking at the state of the industry. Uh, more than 117 or more than 115 agencies responded, uh, 92 of which uh, res responded with saying that they had hiring difficulties. 71% uh, of the organizations had to either implement service cuts or delay service restoration from COVID levels. Uh, and uh, they took up a study with Foursquare Consulting uh, to establish national recommendations. And so I'll quickly move into uh, that area. Uh, this uh, consulting organization identified eight areas that transit agencies were recommended uh, to take up so that they could improve their uh, results. I'm happy to say that, uh, as indicated by sort of this stoplight exercise, Metro Transit uh, is making really great progress in all of the areas. A couple of the highlights, uh, as uh, our existing council members from last session uh, our last administration, no, we increased our compensation greatly, uh, and that's something that's made us very much more competitive in the market. Uh, we have uh, great work schedules right now with more than 90% of the 
uh, runs for our full-time employees being one piece, which is the most desirable time. It's a straight piece of work instead of split shifts uh, overlapping the rush hours. Uh, we're working, as you'll see in a moment here, on creating a really positive work environment the best that we can. Uh, we have clear paths to promotions through things like our Leadership Academy. Uh, worker safety, I can, you can see that we have uh, yellow to green. It's something that we've always taken seriously, uh, but through the 40-point uh, Transit Safety and Security Action Plan, we're really moving that forward since last year when this uh, result came out. Ongoing training has been a theme of ours, uh, and I'll explain just a little bit about some of those areas. And then the hiring effectiveness. So are we making the most of the efforts that we're putting out there um, with things like conditional job offers, which we now have, uh, our CDL preparation for people who are not coming into the industry with that type of experience already under their belts, uh, and then an easy-to-use application. In our case, we've removed unnecessary fields and simplified things like uh, the work experience uh, and removed a high school diploma requirement. Uh, and then finally, the recruiting effectiveness. So when you are out engaging with people, are you doing it in the right way so that they're hearing from people who are doing the job and seeing someone who uh, looks like them so they can envision uh, themselves getting behind the wheel of a 40 or 60 foot bus driving through city traffic. Uh, we are making progress and uh, as you've heard a couple of times, uh, we're making uh, really good strides here. Uh, that's one of the reasons why Adam is joining to share good news about service uh, improvements. Uh, we currently have a target of just over 1,000 operators uh, for our full-time and part-time weekday target uh, with an actual of about 1,050. This is allowing us to be training a high number of employees coming in as well as getting caught up on other training and uh, opportunities for professional development for our existing staff while maintaining that really high degree of reliability. Uh, knocking on wood, we have not had to sacrifice service uh, in a couple of months. Uh, the promise that we made going into March that we would be able to deliver all of the service that we're scheduling is held true, and so uh, we're really proud of that fact. And you can see uh, in our pipeline, uh, we do have some really good numbers. But we're not going to slow down. We know that uh, our business, and especially on the heels of uh, having additional investments made, really requires this frontline staff. And so we're going to continue to hire up uh, the best we can through this year, and then we'll continue uh, moving that forward through next year. Uh, on the recruiting side, uh, you can see I have uh, listed a, a number of these bullets, and this is, uh, this is pretty all-encompassing, but there's even a few things that I wasn't able to fit on the slide. Um, but really, as I mentioned, we're reducing the unnecessary barriers, things that we can evaluate uh, in training that we're keeping some folks from getting in the door in the first place. Uh, twice monthly, we have hiring events, inviting people in to complete their applications, interview, and be able to walk out the door with confidence that they're going to be extended an offer. Uh, and then uh, we had our, of course, Drive the Bus event on February 4th. We're going to be planning something similar for that. Uh, later this year where people could actually get behind the wheel and experience for themselves, uh, whether it was something that they wanted to continue advancing in the process. Uh, every Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m. at our training center, uh, Anna, who was here for recognition last month, uh, hosts uh, what we call a ride session uh, where she and current operators are providing information to prospective candidates so that they're able to really ask questions from people who are doing the job so that they understand and can get that directly from somebody uh, who is in that position. Uh, we have another program, which is probably, uh, it is worthy of uh, both recognition and a standalone presentation later this year, but it's called Operators Engaging and Connecting with Communities. And uh, this prepares our frontline staff to uh, be equipped to actually be recruiters because uh, they enjoy working for Metro Transit. They want to go out into their communities uh, and recruit their friends and neighbors at uh, local businesses, places of worship, uh, and others. Um, on our behalf because they really understand that uh, we're trying to do the right thing here. We're contributing to the community um, and uh, want to be able to help out with that. Uh, described before, but uh, just as a reminder, we have a paid commercial learner permit pro program. Uh, in that uh, program, people start for a week and they're getting fully paid to complete their commercial learner's permit. That's been one of the traditional highest uh, stumbling blocks is being able to study for and complete that permit before starting with us, which is something you need on week one, and so we call this week zero. This is really a preparatory course. We're seeing a really high success rate uh, at just over 90% right now. Uh, Aaron Kosky, the workforce development team, along with uh, our training staff are doing a fantastic job. 
Our advertising up uh, campaign and got an update, a refresh. You'll see buses and trains uh, with our employees uh, there as the models. And so in this uh, picture here, Jessica is one of our operators at the North Loop Garage. Uh, she and her colleagues, uh, as we saw on the previous slide, uh, Lee and Tamika, um, are all mentors uh, in our bus operator apprenticeship program. And so uh, they're proud of the work that they do and uh, they wanna recruit others into the field. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then finally, of course, our human resources department is really focused on a responsive process. One of the things that, uh, that all employers uh, contend with are multiple job offers, and so we're trying to have a lot of touch base. Uh, and as you heard from Anna, Beverly, Janice, who were here last month, uh, they're really engaged in making sure that people feel uh, and know that we want them to join the team. Uh, and finally, uh, last slide for me is focused on our retention efforts because it's one thing to uh, be able to have new people start, but we need to continue to make this a good workplace for our existing employees and uh, making sure that we're doing everything we can to provide that support. The key themes here are both uh, engagement, uh, support, and opportunity. And so the apprenticeship and mentoring program is a two-year long program when people complete their training. Uh, to make sure that they're partnered up with a, uh, a more matured, seasoned uh, buddy, if you will, uh, who provides that mentoring and they have uh, regular touch base meetings over the course of two years. We bring people back for additional hands-on uh, training and they really uh, start to build those connections and have a deep investment. It, it's showing and demonstrating that uh, this job, this career is more than just a transactional type employment uh, setting and uh, we're going to continue to make that commitment in partnership with the local ATU 1005. Uh, and then a couple of the other items, the Red Kite training is focused on resiliency uh, and dealing with uh, sometimes traumatic events that happen out in the, in the workplace. Um, we also have a great workplace project uh, which is focused on how we interact and treat each other and make decisions. Uh, safety and security action plan, of course, really working with uh, frontline staff to make sure that we're addressing their needs. Leadership Academy, I mentioned, which uh, the graduates here uh, completed a six month on the job training that qualifies them uh, to apply for supervisory roles that they otherwise would not have met minimum requirements for. Uh, and finally, our employer resource groups to make sure that uh, everybody, including people, um, you know, we have an advancing women in transit, we have a pride group, BIPOC group, veterans in transit, that people have uh, people that uh, are part of their, their crew and uh, they have a place to connect safely with them. So with that, I'll hand it over to Adam. All right, thanks, Adam Harrington. I'm the Director of Service Development in Metro Transit. And on all that good news, uh, we've got some, maybe a little bit of momentum as we move into our June 17th schedule changes. So this chart, uh, you may have seen something similar before and on the left-hand side is our Bus operator workforce back in 2019, you can see it go down and then now we're just starting to come back up again. And we're uh, with all Brian's efforts and the whole agency really getting our team up to speed and starting to add more employees to operate buses and support them. Now we're starting to add service. We actually added a little bit of service in March and some of that was due to anticipated detours, which now we'll hopefully be put into action this summer with the Osseo Road detour, but we're actually adding real revenue service for our customers as well. And so uh, if you think about back in 2019 as our 100% level of service, we're at about 70% right now. And in June 17th, it'll be another two, two and a half percent more service hours that we have on the street for our customers. And in August, we'll be adding more. Uh, so this is one of the shortest gaps between when we have major schedule changes between June 17th and our August pick. So it's only a couple short months we'll be adding some more service then as well. So a lot of that's based on the positive operator hiring, but also the ridership trends we're seeing. Uh, again, this chart uh, may be familiar to you starting back on 2019 on the left side of it and then breaking it out by route type, whether it's regular route bus, LRT or BRT and some of our most successful ridership corridors are those arterial BRT services that we've added. D-Line back in December is doing really well. And so we'll probably be back to tell more about that story as we get some real numbers in on, on that. Uh, but on to the changes. So as Brian mentioned, service reliability is still number one. We're all really sensitive to providing good service for our customers and how we schedule and how much we schedule is an important aspect of that. 
So some of the same tenants that you see here are ones that we apply both in an upward and a downward service scenario. Uh, but we're looking at where we maybe have cut a little bit deeper in some routes or we have some ridership capacity or we're seeing growth and trying to identify those corridors where we can add that service back. Uh, but we're feeling pretty good about where we've added service. And again, we have another bite at the apple in August and another one in December. So we're moving forward. Uh, the other thing I'll add is that this is for Metro Transit service that we've been talking about, but also our contracted service provider is having improvements in their capacity as well. So when we come to the highlights of what the service improvements are, and of course this slide is tiny, hopefully you have it. Um, <laughs> but there are 15 routes on here where we're adding service back in. We're adding service to some of those routes that were contracted that were reduced to every 120 minutes are going back to hourly service. And we've got a number of core urban local services that are going to every 30 minutes again, which is great. Uh, and then orange line at the bottom of this list will be going to every 15 minutes in the middle of the day. So all of these changes are on our website right now. And you can take a look at each one of them. And I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. But just to give you a snapshot on where those routes are, here's a map showing the distribution of those routes and where the service is being added just for the June 17th pick. So again, we've got our static schedules online. If you go to metrotransit.org, it's right on our homepage. We'll have the actual interactive schedules for Trip Planner uh, active on June 2nd. And it's a really great resource to get all the detailed information. Uh, a couple slides on all the ways we provide information. Uh, I know you have this, so I won't spend too much time on it, but happy to answer questions. These are strategies that we employ every time we make service changes. We try really hard to make sure our customers and communities understand what those changes are, again, whether they're positive or negative. So we're hopefully as attuned as we can be to what the customers need and how we can communicate what those changes are. Uh, we do some general advertising, and these are at stations in particular. And here's just a sample. Of course, this is from the March 18th pick. It should say June 17th because we're, we're there. And that information is there. But we have this type of imagery on our website, at our bus stops, at our stations, on our advertising. So we've got a lot of information out for our customers to help them know what's happening. Uh, we do some targeted marketing and paid advertising in some areas to make sure we get the word out that maybe uh, traditional methods aren't as effective. So uh, we're really proud of the work that we've done at Metro Transit, not just in being able to maintain our network and our service intact, but also how we communicate with our customers. <coughs> A couple samples for targeted advertising. Uh, the orange line on the left, uh, Network Now, which you'll be hearing more about as we plan additional growth in our system, and our uh, Metro Micro North Minneapolis pilot project as well, which has also been a really successful program. So with that, uh, we're happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Would you do me a favor and just back up to that bus operator and service growth slide? And I'll add a couple quick comments for new council members. This one? Yes. So this is why this is super exciting to all of us, because just as we're coming out of the pandemic, obviously there's huge drops in ridership and operators as we're going through all of that. And just when we think we're turning the corner and being able to do some things, you see that big dip down in the orange line where we just we had a need for people who didn't have enough operators. And so we had to cut service and there was a real conscious decision on the map of Met Council and Metro Transit to focus on reliability, that we needed buses and transit to be on time in the right places. And so that our user, our, our riders knew that they'd have a ride wherever, when they needed to go. So being at this point where we can look at things again and when we talk about network now and how we build things out, um, we're really looking to a time where we can go back to thinking that way, which is very, very wonderful, which is why I wanted um, them to present here today, especially you look at some of the improvements in the numbers of operators we have available. And I'm glad you're not letting your foot off the gas. I think that's probably good <laughs> given what we're learning this week. Um, but um, but it's just, it's it's nice to see the positive news. So with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Council Member um, Tyrone Cutter. 
Yeah, my question was, so on uh, uh, June 2nd, if I wanted to have a picture of what lines were coming on and what date, because that's the question I, I'm asked all the time, when is it going to happen? Like, uh, I, uh, so I'll, there'll be, I can say you can go on June 2nd, you'll know when your particular bus that you're concerned with will be there. All right, Madam Chair, Council Member, so it's very particular to those routes. So there are many routes that are still suspended from 2019. And as we move forward through time, remember we're at about 72.5% of where we were in 2019. So there's a lot of changes that have happened okay. still. So there's a lot of service, particularly the Commuter Express, that we're not operating, that we were operating. And as we move forward through our Network Now process, that'll help us think through that and how we start to bring those routes back. So right now we're focused on, for the network we have, how do we strengthen it? How do we provide better service? And how do we recover some of those areas where we felt like we cut a little bit too deep for where we wanted to, but we had to based on what was available to us. So for the routes that we're adding and making changes to, those routes are available right now online and to plan your trip where they match the timetables, that'll be June 2nd. Okay, so June 2nd will be the beginning, but it's a process. As you guys are able to bring them on, you'll bring them on. Right, so okay. June, June 17th is when they'll actually begin operating, and then we'll have another opportunity in August to add more service, and presuming we continue to have positive trends, which I expect we will, and then December again. So we're really looking at the several key milestones to add. Good. Are, are we gonna get a, is there one place I can go and get that picture? in terms of uh, the stages? Madam Chair, Council Member, uh, it may be helpful. We can come back and talk about the timeline for when that happens, but it really is part of a longer process. Uh, we'll be coming back to this committee again in probably a month or so when we start talking about our August changes because they're still in development right now. Okay. okay. So it's the, the challenge we have is we have this lead time between when we're developing okay. the schedules and how many resources does it take before we can move forward? So you're still working it out? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> okay, I understand. Thank you. Right, Council Member Cameron. Um, thank you. So I have a comment and question for each of you. <laughs> so I'll start with um, uh, first on the uh, operator program. Um, I do wanna, you know, we've had conversations about this, but I do wanna lift up the work that your team has been doing um, and congratulate you on, uh, particularly on outreach around um, communities that haven't traditionally thought about being operators. Um, I know that Aaron has reached out to me in the past um, about engaging with communities uh, around entering into the operator program. Um, I do, I did wanna lift up something that you mentioned and that was, um, uh, doing away with the high school um, or the high school uh, diploma or equivalent requirement. I think you know some folks might um, wonder what's going on there, but I do want to highlight that for many immigrant and refugee communities, even those who have completed uh, high school and maybe even college degrees, that it is oftentimes difficult to uh, provide documentation of that. And so you by uh, doing away with that requirement, you bypass some of those barriers for those communities. And so I do want to highlight uh, that piece is really important and um, helpful in including other groups in potentially thinking about uh, being an operator as an opportunity for them. Um, so I just wanted to congratulate you and, uh, and your team on that. Um, I uh, had a question for you. Um, Director Harrington, um, and that is around um, the increase in services provided. Um, so is that all, is that a restoration of um, existing services to what extent, the 2% that it's added in and then what you'll look at for August, is it all restoration of current routes or is there, um, is it looking at adjusting alignments to reflect um, where you know changes in what the the overall metro looks like. So, to what extent do you balance those two things? I could ask you a lot of questions about that, <laughs> um, but which I'll is why we might have them back again. Right, I exactly. think there's a lot. I but, mean, yeah, yeah it's uh, there's a lot of new people, and this right. is a big part of what we're going to be working on over the next. So, weeks. I I will save all of those questions for another time. But really, just um, in 
the services that are being added back for June and August, to what extent is that changing of routes and uh, versus um, restoring routes that were already in existence? Yeah, Madam Chair, Council Member, these are largely restorative type improvements or mm -hmm. bringing service up to a level where we think there's a lot of uh, either community benefit to it or there's loading or we had just previously last December is a good example or October we've reduced the service we're bringing those mm -hmm. levels back to where we think they should be okay all right all right additional questions or comments all right, I would encourage you all to fill out the Network Now survey, which helps, helps direct <laughs> where we actually bring transit back. So, but yeah, thank you very much, and thanks for being a little quick tonight. We appreciate it. So, uh, anything else, Council Members? All right, very good. Thank you for sticking around, and we are adjourned.